This is SSN. Story Studio Network. Welcome to the Fatigue Fixer podcast. Have you ever wondered why you and most of the women you know seem tired so much of the time? Well, this is the podcast where we explore why. I'm here to help you better understand how your body works, whether we're talking about heavy, painful periods, why you have to pee all the time, or what the heck is happening to your body through perimenopause. And I'm not afraid to shed light on conversations that I feel we need to be having out in the open. Like, why are so many women struggling with irritability and anger, drinking more alcohol, and injecting our faces with Botox and fillers in an attempt to stay young? I'm your host, Dr. Sarah Vadbonka. I'm a naturopathic doctor, mom, fatigue fixer, and loud and outspoken woman who's fascinated by the state of modern women's health and well-being. I know that you, yes you, are incredible. And I want you to have the energy you need to share your unique gifts with the world because we are in desperate need of more female leadership. So join me for conversations that will help you feel less alone, more informed about all the things that might be draining your energy, and inspired to fix your fatigue and wake up every morning feeling rested and excited for the day ahead. I can't wait to share today's episode with you. So let's get into it. Welcome back, everybody. Today's episode was originally scheduled to air later in the season, but I decided that I want to talk to you now about this. And what we're talking about today is alcohol. And the reason I want to chat with you now is I am right past the three-month mark of quitting drinking. Now, if you knew me in my 20s or even early 30s, this might be shocking news to hear because I love alcohol. I love drinking. I like everything about it. But a few months ago, I realized I didn't like it anymore. And so as we record this podcast in end of June 2024, I haven't had a drop of alcohol in over three months, and I want to tell you why. But first... If you're listening to this and you're like, oh, great, here comes Dr. Sarah telling me that I can't have my glass of wine or that I have to stop drinking, I want to tell you that that's not what's going to happen over this conversation. I'm not going to tell you that you need to quit drinking alcohol. What I really want this conversation to be about is to share my journey and what led to me deciding to quit drinking. I want to share with you what I've noticed since I stopped drinking, and I really just want us to have a really open and honest conversation about what alcohol is and is not doing for us. If you had told me a few years ago that I would stop drinking, I probably would have laughed in your face. And in fact, when I told a close friend recently that I wasn't drinking, you could tell he was very taken aback and he was like, really struggling to digest this news that I had somehow given up booze. And part of that is, like I said, I love alcohol. I love the taste of it. I love the ritual. I loved how it made me feel. I actually liked being drunk. I loved feeling uninhibited and being funny and loud in the life of the party. Until one day, I didn't love it anymore. And that day came this year in February. So I had a couple girlfriends over for a little Galentine's get together. We watched the Eras documentary, ordered some yummy Thai food, and I had literally one glass of rosé. And that night, I woke up in the middle of the night, sweaty, with my heart pounding. I was having heart palpitations. It was not the first time. And I literally decided right then and there in the middle of the night, I am done with alcohol because my body clearly was not happy. Alcohol was not making me feel good anymore. And for me, essentially what it came down to is the pleasure of having a glass of rosé was not high enough to counteract the pain and the discomfort and the annoyance of having heart palpitations and waking up sweaty in the middle of the night. 
So in hindsight, this day was years in the making. I actually first started to contemplate my relationship with alcohol when a friend and mentor openly shared why she had stopped drinking. And it was the first time that I can consciously remember that I contemplated that maybe someday I would consider stopping drinking. So at that time, I was absolutely not ready to give it up. But I remember that was the first time where that possibility even felt like it could be true for me. It was I was like pre contemplating. It was a thought. Maybe that could be possible for me. And then a few summers ago, I read Quit Like a Woman by Holly Whitaker. And that book was quite pivotal for me because in reading that book, what I realized is that being sober or not drinking is not a punishment. And I think for so many of us, and myself included, up until that point, I had seen that people who don't drink, their lives would be boring and parties would be boring. And it was just like this really sucky thing. And Holly made sober living sound so enticing. She made it sound like it could be this like beautiful way to experience life as opposed to this punishing thing that you'd have to do to yourself. When I finished reading that book, I really cut back on my drinking And since that time, I was probably having somewhere between like one or two drinks a week. So I was still drinking, but I had really cut back quite a bit. What's also interesting, again, hindsight is always 2020. I have read a lot of like sober biographies of women who have quit drinking. I will be sure uh, to share some of my favorites in the show notes of this episode. But it's interesting, again, now looking back, like, why was I so interested in reading all these biographies of women who stopped drinking? So that was definitely part of my journey, was reading about other people and especially other women's experiences. Today's episode is the one where I quit drinking. And again, I want to share a little bit more about what my journey has been like since I stopped three months ago. And really, like I said, I really just want this to be an open and honest conversation about what alcohol is and is not doing for us. I want to talk about what alcohol is actually doing for your sleep because, spoiler alert, it is not helping your sleep no matter what you think it's doing. We're going to talk about why our tolerance seems to go to shit when we hit our 40s. I know I noticed that. And a lot of the women I talk to are like, I can't even have a glass of wine without feeling hungover. And we're going to talk about the risks because part of why I want to have this conversation is that alcohol still has very much of a health halo around it, meaning it's still part of what we see as like a healthy diet or a healthy life. And it can be, I'm not saying it can't be, but we also need to to be honest about some of the risks that we often tend to minimize and downplay. The biggest thing that I'll share with you and the biggest change that I've noticed and part of why I want to do an episode on this specifically, obviously, this, this podcast is to help women figure out why they're tired and how we can fix that. The biggest difference that I have noticed since I stopped drinking is my sleep. I have never slept as deeply as I have in the last three months since I quit drinking. And I am here to tell you, I have tried all the sleep things. I literally, and I'm like kind of embarrassed to say this, but I had a friend of mine who's a naturopath even get me to try literally a rectal suppository. Like I was willing to put things in my bum to sleep better. Okay. I have tried all the things. Nothing has made a bigger difference to my sleep than cutting out alcohol. And part of that for me is that alcohol, I believe, was totally hijacking my nervous system. That's why I was waking up with heart palpitations. It was completely affecting my nervous system. And when your nervous system is jacked up, which a lot of ours is because of the way that we spend our days... It's very hard for your body to actually get into that parasympathetic or rest state that we need to get a deep sleep. Let's rewind a little bit. I want to be clear about something that, again, this journey for me happened very slowly over many years. I didn't just wake up that night and decide I'm done with drinking. It was a long time coming. But I grew up 
as a French Canadian, both my parents are Quebecois. Alcohol is part of the culture. There wasn't a single dinner or party or Christmas where booze was not like a central figure of our celebrations. And I definitely, like many people my age, grew up doing binge drinking. I definitely drank way too much when I was in my 20s and even early 30s. But I was never overly concerned. So I didn't quit drinking because I was worried about my drinking. I would never define my drinking as necessarily problematic drinking. But I was always aware of alcohol because there is alcoholism in my family. So I was always just aware and paying attention to my drinking. It's interesting because I'm not the only one who's quitting. There's actually quite a trend right now of people who are quitting drinking. There's a growing movement of people who identify as like sober curious, which means they haven't completely stopped drinking, but they're way more mindful of their alcohol intake. And they're often choosing non-alcoholic options more frequently. And this is something that I've figured out and learned there are so many more non-alcoholic options available, which makes it easier to go to the party and not feel like the boring person sipping a glass of water. Um, So we're seeing more and more people are choosing not to drink. And again, not necessarily because they're addicted or they have problematic drinking, but just because they decide that they feel better without it. And we're seeing this especially among teens and young adults. They're definitely drinking a lot less than previous generations did at their age. But this is not true for women, especially women in our 30s and 40s. We're actually seeing that women are drinking more, they're binge drinking more, and they are experiencing more alcohol-related harms. So men overall still drink more than women and men overall generally still have more harms from alcohol, but those trends have been pretty stable. Whereas women, we still drink less than men, but our trend is on the upswing. We're seeing more and more women drinking and drinking more and engaging in problematic drinking. And this is a trend that, again, starts in our 30s and 40s and often continues into our 60s and beyond. So Why are we drinking? Why are women drinking more? The first thing is that alcohol is one of the most socially accepted drugs, right? It is perfectly acceptable to show up at an event and drink alcohol. It's something that is completely normalized and it's something that we've also just built into our culture, right? If you're going for a nice dinner, often there's going to be wine or alcohol paired as part of the dining experience, So alcohol is very much something that we associate with pleasure and celebration, and often it actually feels more normal to drink than to not drink. So most people are going to not bat an eye when we see other people drinking, right? It's just part of the culture. It's part of something that we've normalized. What's really interesting, though, and I think one of the reasons why women are drinking more is that we are being heavily targeted through marketing to drink more. I don't know if anyone remembers the skinny bitch margarita phase. I definitely went through the skinny bitch margarita phase. And this is when marketers realized, wait a minute, we have been marketing booze mostly to men. We are missing out on this whole other group of people who could buy our products, and that's women. And this is when we saw products that are directly geared towards women, whether they are light or low calorie, which fuels the diet culture phase. And lately it's like the rosé, right? How many shirts, how many things have you seen rosé all day? It's everywhere. Marketers are not dumb. They are promoting products that are specifically geared towards women, And they do this because they know that a lot of women are using alcohol as a coping mechanism. So a lot of times we're using it for self-care. And for a lot of women who are in midlife, alcohol makes life better. Or at least it makes it more livable. Because often there's a lot going on. And when we've had a super busy day, what feels better than a cold glass of rosé? We're drinking for many reasons, but one of them is definitely relaxation or also a reward for like, oh my God, I made it through the day. I know this was definitely something that I went through through the pandemic. I remember literally every day for probably the first 
three months of the pandemic, as soon as it was four o'clock, I was like, oh my God, we survived another day. I'm having an Aperol spritz because I deserve it. I am living through a pandemic and I deserve my drink at the end of the night. So a lot of us are using it as like a reward just because we we made it. We survived another day. Some people use it as a social lubricant. So especially if you are someone who has social anxiety or you're more of an introvert, alcohol can really help you out in social situations, right? It makes us feel more relaxed. It makes us feel more chatty. Some people are also using it as a sexual lubricant. And a lot of times people who either are not in happy relationships or who find that they're not super interested in sex will often find that alcohol just helps them to loosen up. So it's used for so many different reasons. And part of what I want you to start thinking about, assuming if you do drink, is to start to notice why, like what is actually driving and fueling your alcohol consumption, because I think that's a really good piece of information for you to be aware of. And again, alcohol is a, it's a coping strategy for so many women. And I was thinking about this, like instead of giving women things that would actually help us. So for example, how about we have school and daycare hours that actually line up with work hours? That would be very helpful to a lot of women. Or making sure that we have good quality care for our aging and elderly parents. That would be super helpful. How about you help us with all of the unpaid work that women are doing the vast majority of? But no, we're not going to do any of that. We're going to keep your life hard. We're not going to give you actual proper supports. But here's a nice cold glass of rosé at the end of the day to make your life a little bit better. Right? Think of how powerful mommy wine culture is. This is something, again, that's become so popular that... You're a mom. Being a mom is hard. We're not going to actually do anything to make it easier for you. But again, here is a lovely glass of rosé to take the edge off because you had a really hard day and you deserve to have alcohol. That is your reward for making it through another day. There's so many reasons why we consume. And again, so much of it is normalized and celebrated and rewarded and encouraged. So it's no surprise that a lot of women are drinking more because a lot of times it is a nice way to end the day when you feel like you've had a really friggin' hard day. A glass of rosé does feel de- delicious and helpful. Overall, we know that women are drinking more, especially in midlife and beyond. But how much is too much? Like, is my glass of rosé a problem? That's what we're going to talk about next. I remember when the new Canadian guidelines came out on like healthy drinking, and I had several patients who were so pissed about those guidelines. They did not like being told that they should limit their alcohol to two drinks a week or less. They did not being they didn't like being told that their daily glass of wine might be causing a problem and they they had no intention of changing their behavior. They were very resistant about these new guidelines. So let's chat about how much is too much. Like what is actually causing a problem? So we know that as soon as women consume more than 100 grams of alcohol in a week, so that's the equivalent of seven standard drinks in a week, that increases your risk of death and lowers your life expectancy, period, end of story. So again, if you're having the equivalent of one standard drink a day, every day, so seven drinks per week, you are at higher risk of dying of all causes. And one of the things I think that a lot of women don't realize, although we're talking about it more, is that alcohol does increase your risk of breast cancer. And even if you're having less than one drink a day, it does increase our risk of breast cancer. And part of what is a problem is that most of us are not measuring out our booze. I actually did this last summer. I like was pouring rosé for my partner and I, and I poured out a five ounce glass of wine. And he was like, what is that? I'm like, that is a proper serving size of wine. Most of us, when we pour a glass of wine and we say we're having one drink, we're actually having 
two or sometimes even three servings because no one measures out their wine. And if you do, and I encourage you to do this if you're a wine drinker, measure out a five ounce glass of wine. You're going to see that it looks really sad, especially if you've got like giant wine goblets. It's going to look like nothing. So a lot of times, and I know at restaurants now, when you order wine, they're like, do you want the six or the nine ounce? A nine ounce glass of wine is essentially almost two whole servings of alcohol. So yes, you're only maybe having one drink, but again, your one drink is actually two servings. And if you're having cocktails, I used to love me a good dirty gin martini. That is often three ounces of booze, which again is two servings. We need to pay attention to how much alcohol is actually in our drinks because a lot of us are underestimating how much we drink because, again, we're just like, oh, I'm having one glass, but your one glass is multiple servings. The other thing with alcohol, and again, I think this goes back to like the health halo around it, is that we assume that, well, if I'm doing other healthy habits, like I eat really well and I exercise and I meditate, So it can't be that bad that I'm also having wine, but healthy habits don't undo the risk of alcohol. They're certainly helpful and they reduce your like overall risk of probably getting different diseases, but alcohol, and this is like probably one of the biggest uh, mindset changes that I've had around it is that it is not good for your health. And I think for a long time, we were told that alcohol is good for us and it's part of a healthy diet and they drink it in the blue zones where people live to 100. So it must be good for us and it's good for the heart. But we'll talk more about the research in a moment. Alcohol is not it's not good for us. Does that mean that you can't have it and still be healthy? Of course, you can have it and still be healthy, but we need to stop assuming that alcohol is good for us because it it just isn't. So it does cause harm even if you're doing all the other healthy behaviors. Now, again, doesn't mean you have to get rid of it. It just means that we need to be honest about number 1, how much we're drinking, and number 2, what that is actually doing for us. So, what are the latest guidelines? So, the Canadian guidelines on alcohol and health state the following. Number 1, All levels of alcohol consumption are associated with some risk, so drinking less is better for everyone. So there was this idea before that you could drink, if you stayed kind of under the recommended guidelines, you weren't causing harm, and we're realizing that that's not true. Any level of alcohol is going to cause some harm. Among healthy individuals, there's a continuum of risk for alcohol-related harms, So if you are consuming two standard drinks or less per week, you're going to have negligible to low risk, right? So it's not zero risk, but it's pretty minimal if you stick below that two drinks per week, which is where those new guidelines came from that everyone was real pissed off about. You're going to have moderate risk if you consume somewhere between three and six standard drinks per week. And there is increasingly high risk for those who consume more than six standard drinks per week. And if on any occasion you have more than two standard drinks, most individuals are going to have, again, increased risk of injuries and other harms. So less is best. You can still include it. But if you really want to minimize your health risks, If you want to minimize your risk of cancers, you ideally want to stick below those two standard drinks per week. Um, And then when it comes to women, the health risks for women are higher than for men. And part of that is that women have less of the enzyme that breaks down alcohol. So we absorb up to 30% more alcohol than men do. And alcohol is toxic. Um, I remember I used to really get my back up when people would say alcohol is a poison, Um, but it, it is toxic. It is absolutely toxic and it's more harmful to women at the same dose. And that's not based on our weight. So even if you are a heavier woman, that doesn't mean you metabolize it 
better than someone who weighs less. It's not based on our weight. It's actually based on our actual metabolism and the fact that we make less of this enzyme that breaks down alcohol. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, what about the old guidelines? Those guidelines said that it was perfectly safe for women to have up to 10 drinks a week. I like those guidelines better. And I I get it. Those were the old guidelines. So we went from up to 10 is fine to less than two, which again, shocked and upset a lot of people. But the reason they were changed is that the old guidelines were not reflective of the new evidence that we have. So when we look at the most up-to-date research and evidence on alcohol, the risk really starts when you go above two drinks per week. So that's where that came from. So the old guidelines, if you still follow the old guidelines and you're like, I'm up to 10 and I'm good, you're incurring more harm. That's really all that's happening is you're causing more harm through your alcohol consumption. Now, I want to talk about the heart piece because, again, a lot of people are like, but I heard it's good for your heart. The one thing that alcohol doesn't seem to make worse is heart attack. So if you consume alcohol, you're not more likely to have a heart attack if you stick within those less than seven drinks a week. But you're at higher risk for everything else. So other heart issues, all types of different cancers, accidents, suicide, all of that stuff goes up. If you drink alcohol, not only is our alcohol consumption, again, especially if it's in the higher range, it it is going to kill us sooner. It's going to increase our risk of different diseases, but it also has a huge impact on how we feel. And that's what I want to talk about now is how does alcohol impact your energy, your sleep and how you feel? Let's start with the sleep piece, because as I said earlier, this is the biggest difference that I've noticed since I've stopped drinking. And I want to be very clear that, again, before I quit completely, I was only having one to two drinks per week. Okay, I really wasn't drinking a lot before I stopped. And I have still noticed a huge improvement in my sleep from going to one to two drinks per week to zero drinks. I know some of you, again, are saying, but I don't sleep any better on the days I don't drink. So I don't think this makes a difference for me. And I'm here to tell you that you need to think longer term. You are probably not going to notice a difference if you don't drink for one, two or three nights. I know that would be lovely, but that's not how this works. Just like if you ate a salad for three days, you wouldn't or shouldn't expect that you're going to lose weight right away. It takes some time for your body to find a new state once alcohol leaves your system. I wasn't paying close enough attention to notice how long it took, but I definitely realized pretty quickly, I'm like, I am sleeping so deeply and this feels so (laughs) magical. So why is it that alcohol disrupts our sleep? Like what is alcohol actually doing with our sleep? The first thing to know is that alcohol is a sedative, okay? It does make you sleepy and relaxed. However, sedation is not sleep. Feeling tired and relaxed is not the same as getting good sleep. And what happens a lot when we drink is that we mistake sedation, which is basically just like passing out so you're not awake, we mistake that with deep sleep, But what's happening in your brain when you are sedated by alcohol and what's happening in your brain when you are actually in deep sleep are two completely different things. So it can look and feel the same, but it is not the same thing at all. And as I mentioned, one of the things I noticed for myself with alcohol is that it was completely triggering my nervous system. I would, again, I would feel my heart rate. I would get uh, heart palpitations. Because alcohol has an impact on your nervous system, it can make you wake up more frequently. It also raises your body temperature because it opens up your blood vessels. And one of the things that we need in order to get good sleep is we need our temperature, our core body temperature to drop by about one degree. That's really important for helping us to fall asleep and to stay asleep in a deep sleep. And the thing with alcohol is that 
the impact on sleep isn't always super obvious. So it's not like on the nights that you sleep, you're going to lie awake and not sleep. No, no, that's not what's happening. What's happening is you're experiencing something called micro awakenings, which are these super short, teeny tiny wake ups that are happening throughout the night. But they're so short, you often do not remember or you don't even notice that it's happening. So you think I had my couple glasses of wine. I fell asleep. I slept all night, but I don't feel very good. Why is that? I slept great. You didn't sleep great. You think you slept great, but you actually had disrupted sleep through most of the night. So you are not going to feel as rested as if you hadn't had any alcohol. And the other thing, the other way that alcohol messes up your sleep is that it really interferes with REM. So REM is your rapid eye movement. That is your dream sleep. And that type of sleep It happens all through the night, but it happens a lot in the early morning. And a lot of us know this because a lot of times we're like, oh man, that hour or two before my alarm goes off, like that is the best sleep I get. That's when you're doing a bunch of REM or dream sleep. And REM sleep is specifically beneficial because it helps us to solidify complex memories, really important for our memory, which I know a lot of women struggle with. It also helps you to like make connections and identify patterns. But I think the most important thing, in my opinion, that REM sleep does is that it basically acts as emotional first aid. There is so much emotional processing that happens when you are in that dream sleep. And so when you consume alcohol, you're getting less of that REM. You're getting less of that dream sleep, which means you're getting less emotional first aid. Most of us need that emotional first aid because, again, like we talked about, our lives are very busy and often very stressful. So when you're getting less REM sleep, you're going to have more difficulty managing and coping with difficult emotions, and you're more likely to start to suffer in terms of mental health. What do we do when we feel stressed and anxious? We grab a glass of rosé and we cause the cycle to just keep going round and round. I know it feels like alcohol is helping your sleep, but I promise you it's not. And even if you think I'm a magical unicorn that isn't impacted, you're lying to yourself. With love, alcohol is not good for your sleep. It just isn't. Even if you can't tell that it's making a like causing a problem, it is disrupting your sleep. So If you struggle with sleep and you've tried all the things like I had, including putting things in your butt, what about, like, would you consider quitting alcohol, even temporarily as an experiment? Because like I said, this is the number one thing that I have noticed for me is the quality of of sleep I'm getting is better in the last three months than it has been in years and like I said, I've I've done and tried all the sleep things and this has been a game changer. And I know I'm not the only one. A lot of people that I follow and people that I read who have quit drinking, this is a pretty consistent thing that women report. They're like, I am sleeping better than ever. Just putting that out there for you to think about if you're not sleeping great, maybe time to look at your relationship with alcohol. I also want to talk about What the heck happens when we hit 40 and why our tolerance falls apart? This is something I've noticed. This is something so many of my patients report to me as well. And I think the best way I've heard it summed up is from Dr. Mary Claire Haver, who's a very popular uh, OBGYN in the menopause space. And she basically, I heard her say on a podcast, she's like, I can have alcohol or I can sleep. And that is what I believe to be true for me as well. It got to the point where I was so selective on when I would have alcohol because I knew that even if I had one drink, if I had it close to bedtime, my sleep was not going to be as good. And this is true for a lot of women, especially in midlife. Our sleep is already being often disrupted by stress, by hormonal changes. And then you add alcohol into the mix and it just makes everything worse. We know that alcohol can absolutely worsen a lot of the symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. So it's a trigger for hot flashes. It's a trigger for night sweats. Again, it makes us hotter, which already most of us are hot. (laughs) So it makes that worse. It can increase heart palpitations, which often also are more frequent in midlife. 
Um, and it can worsen histamine. This is something I'm seeing a lot more, which is fascinating. So a lot of women are having more histamine or like allergy like symptoms. And a lot of times these are already worse because of perimenopause and menopause and alcohol can just be like fuel on that fire if you're dealing with a lot of histamine. So why is our tolerance crap? Like what, what is happening? So one of the things, again, women just naturally have less tolerance because we don't metabolize alcohol as well. And often what's happening in midlife is we're experiencing body composition changes where we are losing muscle mass and we are gaining fat mass. And when we do that, we also lose water because water, a lot of our water is held in the muscle. And so when we have those body composition changes, plus we have already a liver that's smaller and we make less enzymes our tolerance is shot. This is another time where I think it could be a really interesting opportunity to look at your relationship with alcohol and to decide, again, what is it doing for me? Because if you're drinking, it's doing something for you. Otherwise, you would not continue to drink. But being really honest about what is it doing for me that I don't like? How is it impacting my sleep? How is it impacting my mood? And then making a decision for yourself about what you want to do with that information. And speaking of mood, again, alcohol is a depressant. A lot of times we're using it as a coping strategy because we're dealing with anxiety or depression or mood swings, but alcohol is not actually helping, right? It's actually making so much of those conditions worse. And again, we know in midlife that women are already at an increased risk of developing or having worsening anxiety or depression. So midlife, again, is like a really key time to reevaluate your relationship with alcohol and to see, again, are the benefits outweighing the risks? And if not, is there something you want to change? I do want to circle back to the cancer risk because as I said earlier, even one drink per day, and again, that's a standard drink. That's your teeny tiny five ounce glass of wine or your beer or your one and a half ounces of spirits that can increase your breast cancer risk by five to 15% compared to women who don't drink at all. And part of what I find fascinating is that because I work with a lot of women in perimenopause and menopause, we often are having conversations about hormone replacement therapy. And there is still so much fear that women have about hormone replacement therapy and breast cancer. And a lot of women do not want to start or they don't want to take HRT because they are afraid of the breast cancer risk. And that, again, we need to make an individual risk assessment and decide for every woman is that benefit risk ratio in favor of HRT. But I have never, ever heard a woman say, I'm concerned about breast cancer, so I'm going to stop drinking or I'm going to reduce my alcohol, right? We will avoid HRT like the plague or even birth control because we're so scared of breast cancer. But meanwhile, we will happily down our glass of rosé every night. This is a big disconnect where, again, HRT has like too much of a negative reputation and alcohol has a health halo around it where we often minimize or downplay or don't realize the impact that it is having on our cancer risk. So if you are concerned about your breast cancer risk, if you have a strong family history of breast cancer or other risk factors, like if you have dense breasts, for example, you might want to think about your alcohol consumption because the risk of breast cancer is the same for women who use HRT than it is for women who drink two drinks a day. So if you're avoiding HRT because you're scared of breast cancer, you might also want to look at your alcohol intake. There's a couple other things I've noticed uh, over the last few months that I want to share Uh, about kind of what I've seen and experienced since I stopped drinking. The first one, which was super interesting. So this was like diet culture coming back. And if you haven't listened to episode one of the podcast, the one where your pants don't fit with Jen Salem Huber, go back and listen to that. We talk a lot about diet culture. And Diet culture is something that even though I've done so much work to try to like free myself from, it it just shows its ugly head every once in a while. And I'll tell you kind of how it's shown its ugly head with regard to alcohol. 
So since I quit drinking, I have been experimenting and trying different non-alcoholic options, right? Because again, just because I quit drinking doesn't mean I want to drink water when everybody else is having a cocktail. So I've been exploring different like mocktails and non-alcoholic pre-made drinks and things like that. And what I noticed is that I was really worried about the sugar content of all of these different things. When I was drinking alcohol, I rarely worried about the sugar content. I rarely was like, I wonder how much sugar is in this glass of rosé or I wonder how much sugar is in this gin and tonic. It rarely crossed my mind. So again, when I was drinking, I wasn't at all concerned about how much sugar was in there. But as soon as I stopped drinking, I was very concerned about how much sugar was in my non-alcoholic drink. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't worry about sugar. We know that having too much added sugar is not good for us. So I am still trying to choose things that are lower in sugar. My point is that I worried about it when I was not drinking alcohol and I didn't worry about it when I was drinking alcohol. So again, how often do we just discount or dismiss the inherent risks that are associated with alcohol because it's just part of what we do. We just have normalized. I never worried about it. The other thing I've noticed, which is shocking, is that I don't crave it. And I think that's because a couple of reasons. I think I did this very slowly and gradually. So by the time I quit, it was like I was not drinking a lot anymore. I also think it helps that I was never addicted to alcohol. I think this would be a very different conversation if I had quit uh, because I was uh, dealing with addiction or alcoholism. But I also think it's just a reflection that this is just what feels good. I feel so good not drinking that, again, for me, the pleasure and the benefit of having a drink for me just absolutely doesn't feel worth how I know I'm going to feel if I consume alcohol. The other thing that was quite surprising, again, like I said, I come from a family of drinkers. So family events and dinners, there's always alcohol involved. And part of me was nervous about being the, well, not the only one, but one of the few people not drinking. But for me, no one seems to really care. And that's been very enlightening because I know that that's not true for everybody. I know that a lot of people, when they stop drinking, experience a bunch of people asking them why and trying to get them to drink and really getting their backs up about it. So I think that is something to think about, that if you are going to stop drinking, people are going to have opinions about it and they can have their opinions. But in my experience, it's been very positive that no one really cares. <laughs> as long as they can have their drink, they really don't care whether or not I'm drinking. Next observation, because I know this gets talked about a lot again in the weight loss space is like, if you want to lose weight, just stop drinking. I have lost zero pounds since I stopped drinking. Um, I think, again, that's probably because I wasn't drinking very much and because my habits are very stable and my weight is very stable, but I haven't really noticed any weight loss. Doesn't mean it might not help other people if you're drinking a lot and you're getting a lot of calories from your alcohol. It could help with weight loss. Um, but I just thought I'd share that because I think some people think it is a magical weight loss cure to stop drinking. In my experience, anyways, it hasn't been. So those are some of my observations about what I've noticed in my three months. I do want to say that I don't know that I'll never not drink again. Like I'm not saying I'm never drinking again for the rest of my life. All I know is that based on how I feel right now, I feel so much better not drinking. And I'm at a point in my life where I want to feel good. I want to wake up rested. I want to have energy. I do not want to be hungover. And so for me, not drinking feels relatively easy because I feel the benefits and those benefits are really important to me. What I want you to hopefully take from today's conversation, number one, is that if you choose to drink, you really want to aim under that 100 grams per week, which is seven standard drinks per week. That's when the risk definitely goes up a lot. If you want to really minimize your risk when consuming alcohol, you should aim for less than two drinks, two or less per week. And again, standard drinks. So also start measuring your booze because it's probably going to be a very shocking and sad wake up call. 
I also want you to start to pay more attention to how you feel. And this is really, again, where the game changer was for me. When I started to realize how I felt when I drank, I was like, this is just, it's not worth it. So pay attention to how you feel when you're drinking. And if you are going to consume alcohol and you're concerned about your sleep, ideally aim to have it four to six hours before bed. So I always joke, like, have your alcohol as early as possible uh, if you want to sleep better. Uh, The closer you have it to bedtime, the more disruptive it's going to be. And I want to leave you with two questions to ask yourself and to think about. Number one, what are the things you like about drinking? Because again, with any habit, whether it's drinking or some other behavior you're doing, there is something you're getting out of it, something positive. Because if you didn't get something out of it, you, you wouldn't do it. So what do you like about drinking? What is it doing it for you? Why do you do it? What are the benefits? And then second question is, what are some of the things that you don't like about your alcohol use? And I think that can be a really interesting place to start is, again, looking at why you're doing it and why you like it. Because if you realize, for example, I'm consuming alcohol when I'm really tired and I'm having a bad day and I know I need to like still parent for the next three or four hours Once you get insight into why you're drinking, you can decide, once you know what the trigger is, is there another way, another non-alcohol way that I can meet that need? If I'm trying to calm anxiety, is there another way I can calm anxiety? If I'm trying to reward myself at the end of the day, is there another way I can do that? I really wanted to talk about alcohol now, because again, I'm at this like really interesting kind of three month mark where I'm seeing lots of benefit, but I'm still obviously kind of like early in my journey. And I also don't know what that journey is going to continue to look like. For right now, I have no plans to keep drinking. But again, I don't know that I'll never drink again. But I wanted you to hear what it's like kind of like a few months into the journey. For me, like I've said, quitting drinking has been so helpful in my overall health, in my well-being, in my energy, in my sleep. And I know that quitting drinking completely is not for everybody. But I hope that after listening to today's episode, you'll be more mindful of your drinking. Maybe you'll start again measuring out your booze. And also just being a little bit more honest about what alcohol is and is not doing for you. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and I will see you right back here in two weeks. Thanks for spending your precious time with me today. If you enjoyed today's episode, it would mean so much to me if you would take a moment to leave us a rating and review and share this episode with a friend who needs to hear it. If you're ready to get more insight into what's making you tired, Find out which of the five most common types of fatigue you're dealing with by taking my fatigue fingerprint quiz at fatiguefixer.ca forward slash quiz. Are you dealing with frazzled fatigue, where your body's exhausted but your brain won't shut up? Or maybe you're more of the drained fatigue type, where no matter how much sleep you get, you struggle to get up in the morning. Just take my fatigue fingerprint quiz and you'll have more insight into which labs to ask your doctor for and what habits and practices are best for fixing your type of fatigue. Find the quiz at fatiguefixer.ca forward slash quiz. Because let's face it, accepting perpetual exhaustion as the norm, that's just not going to fly around here. Last but not least, I want to thank Jen Hudson and Mike Trutler over at Story Studio Network for bringing these conversations to life. I'll see you right back here in two weeks. Bye.